Hello everyone, welcome to my home office. Believe it or not, I had this almost all recorded at work um, right before the end of the school day. And I kid you not, with two slides left, my computer froze and rebooted. <sighs> so bad. But at least you'll give me a little bit more practice since I did the whole lecture already once today. But that's okay. We're going for round two. So, um, psychopharmacology for young and old. So, why is this important? Well, we're going to talk, you know, from all the way before birth, we're going to even talk about pregnancy as well, um, all the way through late in the lifespan. And, you know, starting with kids, it's important because we know that in any given year, anywhere between 13 and 20% of children will have a mental disorder. So, obviously, we need to know how to treat it. The other thing is a lot of these mental disorders will end up being long-standing issues. So as it says here, for um, half of all the um, individuals that have lifetime psychiatric illnesses, those started by age 14. So if you're working with kids and adolescents, you're going to be seeing this. And um, so it's good to know um, how to treat it factors to consider, when to um, refer for medication, when not to, what medications are good um, for a certain disorder, which ones should be avoided, because it's not all the same. They're not just little tiny adults. Um, so we'll get into that a lot more. So first, start, starting with pregnancy, as far as psychoactive medications, there are no approved um, medications for pregnancy. So everything in pregnancy is used off-label. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be. As you'll see, there are several that we'll talk about that really should be used. Um, but that means that, you know, the threshold for safety and, you know, just all the research that you'd have to do hasn't been met um, for these drugs in pregnancy. So over 500,000 women each year um, are pregnant but also have a psychiatric illness. So for each of these, we're going to have to decide whether or not, you know, the risks of the medication um, outweigh um, the benefits and vice versa um, because of what is in the third point. So, you know, the placenta is not going to be really much of a barrier at all because, as you know, for any medication that's getting past the blood-brain barrier, it's very small, it's lipid-soluble, it's going to have no problem going through placenta. And... Um, and with that, it means that the fetus will have the same blood level of the drug as the mother does. So you have to really be, you know, cognizant of that um, because several of these can greatly affect um, child development. However, you know, while it'd be nice to just say, well, you know, that's fine. We just won't, you know, we won't treat it. Um, there are issues with that too. So we know that if you don't treat mental illness, you're going to have poor compliance with prenatal care. Uh, you can have um, exposure to other drugs or medications that are l even less desirable, um, or alcohol use, for instance. Um, and it can also just disrupt um, the mother's ability to care for the child. So, so what that there are often cases, many cases, where the benefits far outweigh the potential risks of using the medication. So, as we were talking about, adequate treatment for pregnant women is absolutely essential um, for many reasons. So, for one, we know that women with severe pregnancy during or se severe depression, rather, during pregnancy. <laughs> severe pregnancy, that's what it feels like at the end of the pregnancy. That's a severe pregnancy. Um, severe depression during pregnancy, we know that they're at high risk for relapse. And also, if you have depression during pregnancy, of course, you have high risk of postpartum after that. Um, and then this next slide really tells a lot of the tale. So what we see is that... Um, you, you have some risk of relapse, of course, no matter what, but um, for those that are maintained on an antidepressant during pregnancy, 70% um, did not relapse, so 30% relapsed. But when you look at it, for those that discontinued, 
you're around 70% that after 36 weeks relapse into depression. So that's a bit different, 70% versus 30%. So that's why, you know, with depression, it's often, it often made sense to maintain the medication um, for someone already on the medication. So which medication made sense? Petzl, no. Um, so you, for a couple of reasons. So Petzl, as, um, as we've talked about, is the strongest of the SSRI antidepressants, and it also has the greatest um, withdrawal effects. So there has actually been an FDA warning with Petzl that um, it can lead to congenital malformations, um, especially at the heart. So in general, Petzl's not a great option. Um, also, not the best options are um, Zoloft, Seletza. Um, they're not as bad as Petzl, um, but you have, again, um, a risk of heart malformations with them. The best, the one that has the, the least amount of that is Prozac. And as many of you know, Prozac is probably my favorite SSRI. So, um, so it, it makes a lot of sense. It's the mildest SSRI. It has um, the least amount of withdrawal effects. Um, so th that's why I think it makes it made sense. Um, another reason why I think this makes a lot of sense is because you know, much like we tell people, don't just you know up and stop an SSRI because you can get those SSRI discontinuation um, syndrome. Um, the same is true for a baby. So actually when you um, have a child born um, with the mother being on an SSRI, you will see signs of SSRI withdrawal. So you'll see uh, irritability and constant crying, sleep disturbances, hyperactive reflexes, breathing and feeding difficulties, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so what, um, what a psychiatrist friend of mine recommends, and I think this made some good sense, is um, switching over to Prozac as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed, and then um, stopping at the beginning of the third trimester. So this gets you pretty much, you know, through, well, the majority of the pregnancy. Um, but also you have it where then the SSRI is out of the system by the time the child is born. So you don't have the withdrawal symptoms once the child is born. Um, another thing you can think about is, um, you know, if the um, OBGYN agrees, um, there are some... Um, well, either a non-pharmaceutical um, intervention, of course, but also omega-3 omega fatty acids. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but they have also shown some benefits um, for depression. So that may make some sense as well. Uh, mood stabilizer. So, you know, with bipolar, that's one that you really don't want to discontinue treatment. So then it becomes a question of, well, which treatment is the least negative? So for lithium, you have a moderate, um, moderate risks um, overall, but some risk of cardiac issues. So in, in general, lithium's not great. Uh, Depakote's the worst um, because you have the highest risk of the um, heart, ma um, heart malformations. And you can see how big of a difference this is. So it's 16% risk instead of 2.9% risk. So for Tetratol, it's, um, you know, it's slightly increased, but again, nothing compared to Depakote. Um, also, lamictal is not considered, you know, a major um, teratogen, but you do have a slight risk of cleft lip or palate with it. And then lastly, um, you do have topamet with um, pretty bad um, risks there. So really, um, tetratol or lamictal are probably the best options as far as bipolar um, 
you know, once once the mother knows that that she's pregnant. For antipsychotics um, in pregnant females, this is another one where you don't want to discontinue treatment. Luckily, there's actually been quite a bit of research on antipsychotics over many years, and overall, they don't seem to be nearly as bad as some other medications. So, as is mentioned here, um, back in the day, typical antipsychotics were actually used um, to treat nausea and vomiting um, in pregnancy, and they didn't have um, major teratogenic effects, so there's that. Um, but this is one where the risk of discontinuing discontinuation are going to outweigh the risk of continuing on the medication. So it makes the most sense to just continue with them. So now moving into preschool and child um, psychopharmacology. Um, I know it feels weird for something that's basically a decade old to say that it's still new, but really in terms of medicine, that's really new. Um, you know, you can, I mean, you know how long it takes for the medical literature to evolve and for treatments to get out there. So it's just not a ton of time. Um, so it still does feel very new. But so the first practice guidelines were 2007. Um, first textbook was 2009. Um, and really what we see here is that as far as the, for preschool, for um, using a pharmaceutical agent, it's really when you have moderate to severe symptoms. If it's mild to even, you know, mild to moderate, um, you're not going to want to use a medication. You'll want to use um, some type of um, psychotherapy. So disruptive behaviors. This is one of the things that you'll get, you know, the most calls on, of course. So there's not been a ton of research on this. So as it says in bullet two, there's no evidence for the efficacy of medications in preschool with OCD, conduct disorder, disruption, disruptive behavior disorders um, without a comorbid mental retardation or autism diagnosis. That said, if you're going to use a medication, and this one's going to come up quite a bit, you'll see, uh, risperidone probably makes the most sense. Um, as far as dealing with um, disruptive behavior disorder or, or aggression in the absence of ADHD. Obviously, if you have ADHD and you have those behaviors, you're going to want to treat the ADHD. That's probably your best bet. Um, it's also going to be important to, um, with these drugs, um, not have them be chemical restraints. So it's easy to just dope the kid up to the point that they're not making any problems because they're not really conscious. Obviously, that's not what you want. And um, and it's something to watch for because, you know, when the problems go away, then no one complains. But, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there's not a problem. It may be that the problem is that the medication's too high and the kid's not able to do what a kid does. So just keep that in mind. So depression does happen in, in kids, even preschoolers. So um, depressive symptoms were common in the study of preschoolers, but what really stood out to me was the second part of that bullet, which is um, for 40% of those children, it persisted for 24 months. So this isn't one of those things that you just ignore and you hope it gets better. If you see a preschooler exhibiting depression, we need to do something about it. Um, often these children have risk factors such as the mother being depressed or some trauma or a very unstable um, household environment. Um, so how do you do this? Um, in general, psychotherapy is the choice rather than medication for preschool and the very young. Um, but the main thing is to realize that Young children are not too emotionally immature to experience depression. So just, you know, if you see it or if you think you see it, just don't don't sell it short. It's like, yeah, you know, a four-year-old can be depressed, which makes me sad as a father of a four-year-old, though I think she's happy. But, but just keep that in mind. So what about pediatric bipolar disorder? So you can see bipolar... Um, 
even in pediatric populations, it's not super common, but it, it's there. So the initial studies looked at um, lithium and anticonvulsant such as um, valproic acid, uh, which is Depakote. The newer ones have looked much more at um, antipsychotic drugs and also, um, you know, they've compared lithium, Depakote, and Risperidone. I kind of like Risperidone if I'm, you know, if you have to. Obviously, you know, you know me. I don't recommend medications if I don't have to, but. For me, from my read of the literature, I think Risperidone kind of offers you the best um, treatment benefits versus um, side effects. But take a peek for the literature you know, on your own. The one thing that is kind of notable that's different than what you see for adults is that SSRIs are not really recommended for pediatric bipolar. Usually you just do the, um, the mood stabilizer, so keep that in mind. So speaking of which, let's talk about um, depression and issues with treating depression. So as you know, the, um, the FDA put out a black box warning on pretty much all the SSRIs, uh, all the antidepressants for adolescents and teens uh, because of the high prevalence of suicidal ideation and suicides. Um, but with that, you also have a high prevalence of those when left untreated. So you get into this catch-22 of, um, you know, darned if you do, darned if you don't. Um, so in general, if you have depression, it should be treated. Though whether or not to use the medication, which medication is, is worth talking about, and we'll get into that. A um, bunch of these kids experience childhood adversity, um, not surprising. Um, adolescence is the period of highest risk for onset of depression. And um, and you want to treat it again, because if you don't, it's associated with later development of personality disorders and, and other issues. So you can't just let these things fester. So the medications do help, um, but it's not often a huge help. Um, so here you can see fluoxetine, so this is Prozac uh, versus placebo. You can see it, it's more like maybe five points on this scale. Um, so it's something, but it, it's not like cutting the scale in half, which we'll see some others where it's like cutting it in half. It's not that. So overall, what we see, um, so let's just look at CBT, Prozac, and combination. And one of the things that's really interesting about children is even more so than what you see with adults, uh, combination therapy often has the best outcomes for children. So overall, um, patients in all three groups got better. That's the good news. One thing that is notable is really um, you need to treat for longer than you would for an adult. So minimum nine months is usually needed um, with longer being better as far as persistence of benefits. So keep that in mind with, with your treatment. Um, I mean, nine months feels like an eternity for a kid, I know. You know, you remember how long a school year was? That, that you know, but, but that's, that's what the literature shows. Um, so we talked a little bit about the black box warning, but one of the things that does help is seeing a therapist every week because you have someone to check in on that to assess the suicidality, make sure things are going okay. So... That is one way to counteract that you know, potential side effect is if you're doing combination where you have both the, the antidepressant on board and the therapy, you know, you have that added layer of safety for it. Uh, fluoxetine um, is the preferred agent. Again, I think it made sense. I just like fluoxetine though, so keep that in mind. Plus it's dirt cheap, you know, for what's worth. Um, so if you have it where someone, you know, an adolescent is resistant to treatment, then you can try different SSRIs though, or you could try a mood stabilizer or a um, antipsychotic agent added on to see if that may help. Um, let's suppose also a nice option. So um, until recently, Prozac was the only drug that's approved for childhood depression. Then Let's Pro is approved um, about a decade ago now. Um, now with that, I want you, you know, I want you to know the the study. 
Yeah, we're not talking about a huge difference in scores. You're talking versus placebo, you know, 22 versus 19. So a three-point difference, not a huge difference, but but still a significant difference. Um, there haven't been any studies that I'm aware of that have compared uh, Let's Pro to um, Prozac head-to-head, -head. but A, it'd be interesting, but honestly, I, I still think Prozac would win, but it's an empirical question. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to use a fetcher. Um, so it works, it's efficacious, but there are pretty significant side effects, including um, suicide attempts, hostility, hallucinations. Um, it's associated with a higher rate of self-harm, um, more likely to lead to a manic flip if someone has bipolar disorder, and at least one study found poor efficacy for it. So... If you see a fetcher with a kid, it may be worth talking with the uh, prescriber because it's probably not the best choice. I'd much rather see a Lexapro or a Prozac. So looking at antidepressants and suicidal ideation, so this was a pretty good sized study. And, um, you know, what happened is, or I guess this was a study, but it's looking at the children that... Um, died by suicide, and a lot of them were on antidepressants, and that's what led to the black box warning. But again, you have it where, um, you know, chicken or the egg, you know, are you better off treating or not treating? And in general, I think you're better off treating, um, especially if you do combination therapy where you can have someone check in and you're going to have, you know, that benefit of safety because someone is going to be assessing that that kid regularly uh, for suicidality. So what about pediatric bipolar disorder? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but going into a little bit more of it. Um, so in general, um, lithium, anticonvulsants, um, second generation antipsychotics, um, all of these have shown some benefit for um, for helping reduce mania. The one you want to avoid is lamental because you have um, rather high rates of Steven Johnson syndrome, which I don't know if you've ever seen this or have heard about it. It's a really nasty side effect, potentially life-threatening, where the, the skin actually can fall off the body. It's, it's really horrific. Um, so you want to avoid lamental because of that. Um, Again, combination therapy with, um, um, well, with CBT is recommended. And as we talked about earlier, um, we don't have a lot of data on the depression side of it. So usually it's just doing the mood stabilizer and not um, adding on an antidepressant as well. So... What about anxiety? So this is another one where it shows the benefit of the combination therapy. So, and I, it surprised me. It had been a while since I've looked at the study. So it surprised me again just how big the effect was. But you can see that it's about 60% showed an effect for CBT, but about 80%, so another 20% just by adding on Zoloft. So just adding on an SSRI. So, you know, that's pretty good. You know, here's here's what it looks like graphs. So you can see, um, you know, definitely, um, you know, CBT and medication are both better than placebo, but really the combination is a clear winner. PTSD. Oh, yes, PTSD. So, sadly, there, you know, you do have PTSD in preschoolers and, and young children. Um Difficult to treat. The evidence really supports uh, psychotherapy, as you can imagine, and medicine is not endorsed by experts. But what kills me is that 89% still use it, even though it's not recommended. Um, and then benzodiazepines are not recommended, thank goodness. We'll talk more about that when we hit older adults, but just in general, benzodiazepines are really... I can't really think of a use case in outpatient practice where they make a lot of sense. That so maybe that's just me. Um, well, I can't think of a couple, but anyway, that's a whole different story. 
the only times would be like very time limited like a person has to get through one public speech and will only use it the one time um but there are just a lot of issues with um with abuse uh risk with um they literally cause cognitive deficits there's a lot of negatives with benzodiazepines you have to consider um OCD, as you can imagine, much like adults, your CBT interventions are going to be preferred. Um, you can use an SSRI if you have to, but usually it's only recommended with CBT and only after just CBT is not working for you. So what about older children? Well, here we actually do see a benefit for combined therapy again. So again, this is looking at Zoloft, and what they found was the combined therapy, again, about 20% better than CBT alone. So a meaningful difference. So autism, I thought I'd just touch on briefly, um, since I know many of you are interested in autism. So unsurprisingly, psychotropic medications do help with reducing aggression, self-injurious behaviors, anxiety, um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and actually, it was SSRIs that were used until recently when, um, again, recently being 10 years ago, but, you know, that's how things move in medicine sometimes. Um, but the later, the more recent literature has not shown that they're terribly effective for helping with this. So now it's much more the atypical antipsychotics and mood-stabilizing drugs that are being utilized. Um, so things like risperidone. So for autism um, in very young children, uh, so you know, we're th looking at, you know, where it's recognized by age three. Um, again, risperidone makes quite a bit of sense. So 63% um, showed a positive response for um, behaviors associated with autism. And it's approved for ages five and older. So it actually does go down quite a bit. And you do have the, the FDA approval for that. Uh, Abilify could also be considered for kids a little older, like six to 17, um, specifically with irritability. And here you can see the, um, the data for risperidone. So you can see how big of a difference it's making. So this is notable. You know, like if you looked at week eight, it's basically half um, of what what it is otherwise. So so that's a notable difference. As I alluded to earlier, I'm a big fan of the omega-3s. Um, the, the data are mixed on these, and if you take the Cytoform class, we'll talk a whole lot more about them. But, but there are some good data. Um, we'll talk about cytosis a little later, but it's really kind of exciting stuff with cytosis. Um, but looking at bipolar first, um, half experienced a rapid 30% reduction in symptoms with no notable side effects with adding on an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. That's really cool. So keep that in mind. You'd still obviously want to talk with the, um, the child's pediatrician before you implement that. But that's, you know, if the pediatrician's not opposed, that's something that we can do in our practice very easily. Um, so I just want to touch briefly, I know we've already hit on this some, um, but for behavioral or aggressive disorders, the main drugs you're going to see are atypical antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. And out of these, I like risperidone just because it's been studied the most with kids. None of these are going to be FDA approved for treating aggression, you know, but but as far as what they're actually approved to do and how much research has been done, for me, I think risperidone is your best bet. So schizophrenia, quite rare in children, but but does become much more as you get into later adult or later adult later childhood. So as you see here, about a third of patients with schizophrenia will develop psychotic symptoms between the ages of ten and twenty. So if you're looking at the you know the teen years, adolescent years, yeah, there's a decent chance you're going to be seeing some of this. So 
it's good to think about, you know, okay, if you've seen it in kids, what treatments do we recommend? So, probably not Haldol, um, because you're going to have the extrapyramidal side effects. Uh, Clozeril, Risperdal, or Risperidone, um, Zyprexa, Seroquel. You know, usually I'd use the generic names, but I just say I'm trying to do the the brand names because you probably know those better. All of those are equally effective. Um, again, I I just like risperidone um, based on the literature, but it is worth noting for both risperidone and lansipine, uh, you have a side effect of waiting, so you have to weigh the the pros and cons with that. And if it's a child that already has a weight problem, those may not be the best drugs. I promise you, it's adding um, data on um, omega threes. So here you go. So they studied omega threes in eighty one adolescents with sub threshold psychosis, uh, looking at who actually converted over into psychosis later on. So half dot omega threes and half dot placebo. And what was cool is that only 4.9% of the omega-3 group um, transitioned into a psychotic disorder, whereas 27.5% of the placebo group did. So, now granted, this is not a huge sample. You're talking 81 adolescents, but still notable, really notable. So, more research needs to be done there, but again, consider those omega-3s. There's something there. So moving on to geriatric um, psychopharmacology. So we know, you know, the older population itself is getting older. Uh, the oldest old group is the fastest, in, you know, increasing age group. And life expectancies are going up. Um, so just a couple things to put into perspective. In 1994, the 65 to 74 age group um, was eight times larger than in 1900. Um, the 75 to 84 age group was 14 times larger, and the 85 plus um, age group was 28 times larger. So, big change over the course of about 100 years. Um, after 80, you also see a lot more women than men, which is worth considering. So um, women actually outnumber men by a three to one after age 80. We just don't make it that long. Sorry, guys. So um, older adults make up about 13% of the population, but they're important for psychopharmacology. They are about 25% um, of psychotropic prescriptions and about 30% of all prescriptions. So your average older adult hits uh, 4.5 prescriptions every day and gets about 13 prescriptions a year. If you're sick, it's about eight to 10 prescriptions a day. So all this is to say, oh boy, we have a lot of interactions we have to consider with older adults. So keep that in mind. Um, the hospital data always kind of freaks me out. So these are just people, older adults going into hospital for whatever reason, not, you know, not necessarily for psychiatric reasons. And with that, you see that sit or 32% of the group over 60 received some psychotropic medication. Um, but also when you're looking, you know, within that, um, you have a huge number receiving um, benzodiazepine. So, um, so that's notable. And also a very large percentage uh, receiving an antipsychotic medication. So both of those are probably to help with the anxiety of being in the hospital and helping with sleep. But still, they're notable because these are people that are not reporting psychosis. And actually, antipsychotics are not great in, in late life, though they're used all the time. We'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, but benzos especially are problematic, and I'll talk about that more in a couple slides too. So I'll save it for that. But, um, but yeah, kind of scary. So a couple things just to be aware of with older adults, because people often think, well, older adults are more likely to be depressed, they're more likely to be having issues with transitioning with aging or with disability. 
Uh, it's normal for older adults to have cognitive impairments. These things are not normal. You know, older adults are not usually lonely. They're not usually depressed. Quality of life is actually highest in late life. So when you're seeing these issues, it's important to realize that their symptoms, their problems, are not things that are just normal that should be ignored. You also see a lot of changes in pharmacokinetics with late life. So first of all, you have changes in your ADMEs. You know, in, in general, half-lives are much longer. So this means you need to change the doses of the drug. So in general, you're going to do lower, um, start lower and go slower, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, it's kind of the rule of thumb because it just doesn't take as much for older adults. Also, tons of interactions. Again, you know, it's not uncommon that people are taking, you know, if you're sick, 15, 20 medications. So a lot of interactions to be aware of. And you want to work closely with your um, pharmacist just to make sure you're not, you know, hitting anything. Side note, pharmacists are very underrated. Um, I mean, it's really cool being able to go into a, a, you know, CVS and talk to a healthcare professional for free and get expert advice. Um, and I love pharmacists. Pharmacists are great, underutilized. Um, befriend a local pharmacist. It's worth it. Um, anyway, so... Lower doses of medications are usually used, and we usually start lower than normal, and we go slow as far as increasing the dose, because those half-lives are, are prolonged, so it's going to take longer to get out of the body. And a lot of this is just because the enzymes in the liver are decreased, so the drugs aren't going to break down as much. Um, you know, Or if you remember, actually, a couple of lectures ago, it's going to take it longer to make them um, less lipid soluble um, so that the kidneys can actually hold on to them and excrete them. So benzos, I promise I talked about benzos. Um, many problems with benzos in late life. So as the book says, it can be quite dementing. Um, and some of this is because of that... Um, longer half-life. That's also why you see the problem with falls, because you can easily have it where a benzo taken the night you know before is still affecting an older adult the next morning. So, you know, you have that increase in risk and falls, you have cognitive difficulties, but also these drugs have actually been um, shown to be associated with cognitive deficits, with like permanent kind of deficits. So I'm always very hesitant to recommend a benzo. Almost never recommend a benzo. Antipsychotics, again, I, I mentioned that um, there are issues with older adults. It's actually a black box warning for using antipsychotics for the treatment of ag agitation and psychosis because it actually increases the risk of death. Um, that said, there, it's used all the time. Um, when I worked at the um, the nursing home, it's used all the time. You know, the book says that, you know, part of it is that um, there's little evidence showing that this works. Um, well, at least it says what the core symptoms of dementia. I agree with that. It definitely works with the behaviors. You know, the problematic behaviors you can see with um, dementia, it helps there. But, again, this is one where you have to really be careful, too, about... Um, chemical restraint. I've seen so many people where there were complaints about them, so they doped them up, and then they just send you out of bed, and no one thought, oh, this is a problem, because they're no longer being a problem. Like, nursing staff is happy, you know, Freddie's no longer a problem, but Freddie's also missing meals, and is not engaging the way Freddie used to, and, and seems like a zombie. You know, this is not good. So, so keep that in mind, because sometimes, you know, you may have to be the one that actually brings up to the treatment team. I think, you know, I, I worry about the ethics of this. I think this is a chemical restraint. And that does not make you popular. It's not an easy thing to do because the nursing staff is happy often because the person's not an issue. But 
but it's not ethical. So so keep that in mind. And I don't mean to throw nurse, nurses under the bus. Nurses have a tough job. And the reason I talk about nursing stuff is they're usually the ones that get the brunt of the, the challenging behaviors. So that's why they're particularly happy when the challenging behaviors go away. So by no means am I saying that they, you know, I'm not hating on nurses in any way. It's just that often, you know, they're the ones that get that immediate relief from, you know, from the use of the benzo. Or not the benzo. Please don't use the benzo. From the use of the antipsychotic, um, and it may make it harder for them to, to see, you know, some of the negative consequences of it. So depression is very common in late life. About 15% of older adults have um, depression. Um, if you see a late onset, it can uh, be a sign of either an early dementia or it can predispose one for dementia. Or, yeah. Something that amazes people, uh, depression is actually more prevalent than dementia in nursing homes. I don't know if you knew that, but very, very common. Um and a good number of people will um, develop depression within a year of entering a nursing home. Something that's interesting with older adults that people wouldn't suspect. Um, older adults actually prefer psychotherapy rather than pharmacotherapy. So a lot of people think that that's not the case, that older adults will have some stigma against psychotherapy. And um, because of that, they just default to the pharmacotherapy. But that's not the case. Um, research has shown that that doesn't bear out. So keep that in mind. Older adults are probably going to be open to psychotherapy. It's a really good place to start. But if you are treating with an antidepressant, a couple things to be aware of. First of all, start with half the adult dose. Again, we start low, we start slow, we work our way up. Um, in part because we are starting low and slow, it usually takes longer to show a treatment effect. So you're talking about about 12 weeks to show a treatment effect, where it's usually about eight weeks for depression for adults. Also, you're going to want to have a longer duration of treatment um, in order for it to have the highest likelihood of being successful. So one medication I want to talk about that we don't talk about a ton, you know, in general, the vast majority of antidepressants that work for adults are going to work for older adults. Um, Remeron is an interesting case, though, because you do see some pretty good results as far as reducing depression. But what's interesting is that a side effect of this medication is weight gain, which usually is a negative. But for older adults, that's often a positive. You know, often we're trying to make sure that they maintain their weight in case they get sick. So, you know, a sickness isn't much worse. Um, so that's one to keep in mind because they actually can have a positive impact if it is an older adult that also needs to gain weight. Um, there are some concerns with using um, antidepressants with older adults. Overall, the response rate is not very good. Um, you do have an increased risk of um, mortality and morbidity. Um, and also, if you have an anxiety disorder, which is very common for older adults, it ends up being um, a much pro poorer prognosis. So, in general, if at all possible, I'm doing um, CBT for depression if I'm seeing an older adult. Speaking of which, brief thing, um, CBT is mostly the same, but with an older adult, you're going to want more sessions, shorter sessions. You know, the whole 50-minute hour thing often doesn't work. They're used to, you know, doctor's appointments that are 15 to 20 minutes. That's kind of what you're going to need to do. 30 minutes and you're pushing it, but you can do 30 minutes. But 50-minute hour is probably not going to be what you want to do. Uh, fewer sessions, shorter sessions, you're, you'll be good to go. Uh, for anxiety disorders, a very common in late life. Um you can have also phobic disorders onset after age 60. Um, some of this is going to be because also you may have, you know, some health issues. Like um, I remember I, I saw someone that had um, agoraphobia set in later in life, but it's because he had problems with incontinence. So sometimes the health issues bleed over into the psychiatric issues. 
Um, you don't see a ton of panic disorder. Um, and you can, of course, have a lot of comorbidities with other psychiatric disorders. Um, so what should you use? Uh, not benzodiazepines. Uh, again, we talked about you know, sedation, um, obviously, um, which can cause falls, um, problems with learning and memory, um, a lot of issues with, um, with those. If you're going to use the medication, again, I would do a C you know, do CBT first. Um, probably lorazepam or um, probably lorazepam is one of the bed better ones if if you have to, you know, use one of these medications, if you have to use a benzo. Um, but in general, just just try not to. Uh, sorry, guys. I just, I'm not a big Benzo fan. So what do you do with anxiety, then, if you don't have a Benzo? Um, Non-pharmacological therapy. Um, again, I try to avoid um, Benzo. So something like lorazepam, a.k.a. Ativan. Um, why do I say that one? Um shorter half-life. Basically, the shortest half-life you can find is what you should do if you have to use a benzo. Um, SSRIs, um, Buspirone, um, aka Buspar, um, made some sense, but CBT. CBT, if you can do it, you start there. If that doesn't work, then you look at adding down the SSRI um, or Buspar. Um, and then Benzo is kind of the last, you know, if nothing else works, then you look at the benzo. So I hope that helps. Um, let me know if you have questions, and um, I will see you later.